I'm a big first things first guy. If we don't, if the ocean system is not working, we're all dead. Sure. It doesn't matter what we do on land. It's two thirds of our air, 100% of our water, and about half the people every day count on protein from the ocean. And so if the ocean system fails, this is one of the things I think is so interesting when you look at all research and all these kind of nonprofits and all these various activities, when you look at like earth system management, because we don't have like an earth council, which is like the dumbest thing of all time. Like we're on the no plan plan for the planet. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so, but anyway, at least if you're gonna try to affect something, if the planet's going to exist, we must save the ocean first. Yeah. Hundred percent. Because I mean, if we lose the ocean, we're all dead on land, no matter what we do. Yeah, it's inarguable. Welcome to the Art of Coaching podcast, a show aimed at getting to the core of what it takes to change attitudes, behaviors, and outcomes in the weight room, boardroom, classroom, and everywhere in between. I'm your host, Brett Bartholomew. I'm a performance coach, keynote speaker, and the author of the book, Conscious Coaching. But most importantly, I'm a lifelong student interested in all aspects of human behavior and communication. I wanna thank you for joining me, and now let's dive into today's episode. Blind spots, we all have them. They're a part of life. They're inescapable. No matter what we do, no matter how educated we are, you're going to have a blind spot. Now, what is a blind spot? It's that unseen thing just outside of your periphery that can be your undoing if you don't recognize it. Now, here's the irony. A blind spot can also lead to a newfound awareness that becomes your greatest strength. I mean, guys, think of it as unconscious competence. Think of it as a lesson we haven't learned yet and will be wiser once we have. We have created a course that helps you discover your blind spots so you're never caught unprepared and also leverage them. So some of your greatest strengths, even the things that you think are so simple that nobody else would value them, you can leverage them to do more good, help more people. And you can learn more about it at artofcoaching.com forward slash blind spot. It is my latest course. It is all self-paced and it is for anybody who wants to find their niche, really hone in on their focus, help more people, and actually get paid to do work they love. None of this stuff is gimmicky. It's all very, very tactical. This is something I've worked on for a very long time. And we get tons of people that reach out that say, hey, I'm, I, I, you know, I love what I'm doing, but I feel like I could be doing more, or I'm not sure I'm on the right path, or you know, there's a lot of paralysis by analysis, and I doubt myself, or I overthink. If any of that describes you, or even if you're just somebody that maybe you have a great career, but you're looking to expand what you do a little bit, maybe you want to write a book, maybe you want to create a podcast, maybe you want to just do anything that allows you to provide more value to more people, this is for you. So again, I highly encourage you guys, check it out, artofcoaching.com forward slash blind spot. This is where you want to be. All right, today we have a fascinating interview. A friend of mine who's been on the show before, Carl Coward, told me about this mythical creature, this gentleman named Chris Fisher, who is a modern day Jacques Cousteau. And guys, if you don't know who Jacques Cousteau is, look it up. But this is somebody that really revolutionized exploration, especially within the oceans. And Chris is not only <laughs> taking his uh, taking uh, from his example, but Chris has completely, completely surpassed many of the things Cousteau was able to do. And I mean that respectfully, and so does Chris. An explorer and a disruptor, Chris has led 39 global expeditions focused on accelerating the ocean's return to balance and abundance, specifically, guys, by unlocking the life history of white sharks. You are talking about a guy who has, is being able to lead research on the blood work, migration patterns, behavior, all these things that give more insight into the genetic status, diet, all these pieces about great sharks and really how critical they are to the ecosystem. His company, Osearch, connects the practical aspects, let's look at expert fishermen, for example, with the academic side, researchers. And by creating this multidisciplinary model, Osearch is able to gather world-leading information about everything regarding white sharks and more ocean creatures. And to hear about these expeditions, 
is eye-opening. I mean, no matter what field you're in, you understand that all of us have professions where there's a tremendous amount of nuance. The work is always bigger than most people see, right? When uh, anytime I train athletes, people think it's about the workout and oh, is it the kettlebells or the dumbbells? It's so much deeper than that. Uh, if you're a comedian, people think it's just about the writing of jokes. No, it's so much deeper than that. If you're an educator, people think, oh, uh, what are you gonna make the students memorize today? No, it's so much deeper than that. And nothing could be more true for what Chris does. We're going to talk about his family history, how his father being an entrepreneur, you know, led him to really not only being able to get into a profession where he could give more, but where he could go into a field where so much data, so much unique nuance had to be siphoned through so that it could break through and make sense to a larger audience. Because let's be real, guys, your information goes nowhere without an audience. He's going to talk about how they tag sharks, the behavior of the sharks, how you can track them in real time, the nature of bringing open source information. I could keep going on and on and on, but you have to hear this episode for yourself. It's one thing to hear from coaches and leaders and entrepreneurs. It's another thing to hear from a guy that gets out there, goes all around the world, tagging, studying sharks uh, for a living and, and seeing them do things that nobody else has ever seen them do before. I know I'm rambling. We just got off the interview. I was super excited about it, so I apologize. Without further ado, Chris Fisher of OSearch, dive right in. Chris Fisher, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, likewise. You know, I always think that conversations like this are fun because this is really the second time you and I have talked, introduced yeah. by a good friend, and there's no staging, there's no... Uh, hey, we have this script behind the scenes. We're getting to know one another as the audience is getting to know you. So I appreciate you taking the time. Happy to be here, man. So first off, I have to say this, and this is just because our audience, we have a fair share of nerds here. I was on a podcast recently as a guest and somebody said, hey, give me three apps, right? And you know, usually people want productivity apps. They want something else that, oh, what's a hack? And I told them your app. I said, oh, search. And I'm not lying. I have the app. And because uh, I think it's fascinating. I grew up fascinated with sharks. Tornadoes and sharks were a huge thing in mine growing up. I also wanted to be an assassin. I don't know about that. But um, the person was taken aback and they go, time out. What is this app? And I go, yeah, man. Like you know, This guy's like a modern day Jacques Cousteau. He goes around, he tags sharks, very data driven. You can look and see where great whites and more are all around the world. Uh, I'd love for you to give our audience a little bit more context as to the nature of O-Search and the mission that you're on before we dive in, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Yeah, no, the app was a big breakthrough. And, um, you know, we started this journey, I guess, just for the stay in the shark space. We started working on the water a little over 20 years ago and started seeing that, you know, our, our best scientists and our best watermen, professional watermen weren't working together. So we didn't have the best information we needed to make sure we could leave the ocean full of fish for our kids. Really just make sure they can eat a fish sandwich. And uh, so I started to see that, you know, just to distill it down and I started helping scientists in around 2005 or six, they all started complaining about sharks, big sharks. I remember down to 9% of our large sharks. And then I was like, okay, well, whatever, you know, we were helping scientists study billfish, tuna, other things like that. I didn't study any of this. I grew up in Kentucky chasing fish and frogs around the wood and, you know, studied entrepreneurship at IU and the National University of Singapore. It's Indiana University. And uh, who has finally has a football team? Unbelievable. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. They're coming out of out nowhere. What, what is this, their best season, I think, since the 1960s, roughly? The first time they oh, I mean, I was there from 87 to 91, and it was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I'm living as a Husker fan now. Our, our fortunes are reversed. <laughs> exactly. And so they started saying things like, man, if we don't fix the sharks uh, situation, there's not going to be any food for our grandkids. And I was like, whoa. And uh, how does that work? And it's pretty, it makes a lot of sense. You know, the top of the food chain, you can't manage the system if you can't manage the top of the food chain. And really like to break it down into practical matters, things like seals up north, if the white sharks are present, the seals eat one fourth as much each day. So if the white sharks aren't there, they go out and they wipe out the cod and the salmon, the lobster, everything. And, you know, down south in other areas, they, they put a lot of pressure on the squid. So every night when they come to the surface, they don't eat all the fry, all the baby fish we need to grow up, baby tuna, baby mahi, all that stuff. 
I said, well, certainly someone studying. I'm like, we're helping you with these things. You know, where are they mating? Where they give birth? How they move around? Let's help them come back. Let's look after the nursery. I said, they're so big. We've never been able to study them. We don't know. And Ma was just stunned. I was like, you just said no big sharks, no fish sandwiches. And right. Saying, we don't know. Yeah, I, I, I remember, and I don't want to cut into your story here, but I remember my wife and I went to South Africa for our honeymoon. And I remember we had a guide because we did the whole, you know, cage, shark cage thing and what have you. And they had told us, and I think you're the aficionado here, even though, like you said, O-Search is about the bigger ocean ecosystem as a whole, not just sharks. But they had said at the time that nobody had actually seen or at least gotten footage of two great whites mating. Yet I know you for a fact, you've drawn blood from great whites, you've collected sperm samples from great whites. Are you, are, were you guys the first to do that, by the way? Just fact check me there. Yeah. Yeah, from a living great white shark, yeah. Right, so like I've trained mixed martial artists and boxers who, you know, they draw blood in a way for a living. You can actually yeah. go around and say, hey, I'm the first guy to ever draw blood from a great white. And I know that's tongue in cheek there, but is that true that nobody's really caught footage of great whites mating as well? Or is that- Yeah, that's out? true. Well, first you have to know where to look, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's going to be, these things are so stealthy. I think what most people don't understand around white sharks, they're the most nervous thing in the ocean. Like when we're out there and we see one and we're trying to get one to come in, we won't even take a step on the deck of the boat. Really? Because you feel like if you just move, they're just gone. They're so nervous. You got to think of them like a lion or a wolf, you know? And so, uh, you know, they're super stealthy. They're invisible. Think about the 4,000 pound sharks we've had tagged all over the world, even right here on the East coast of the United States. And these animals are swimming right up and down the beaches in and out of the estuaries. We've all been swimming with white sharks our whole lives. If you live on the East coast of the United States, nothing's changed. We just know now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and no one has ever seen them. Like, can you imagine a 4,000 pound female like Mary Lee cruising up and down the East coast for five years? No one ever saw her. No. She was in and out of the beaches and estuaries all the time. So they're invisible. So you're not going to see two white sharks mating unless it's the, you know, once in a million lifetimes. Right. Um, but you can capture them, get blood samples from them test the estrogen in the females, the testosterone in the males, get sperm samples from the males, see if the sperm are mature and motile, and you can find the mating site without witnessing them mate. And then maybe if you do zero in on that and you spend some time in that area, maybe you can, you know, get lucky. And that to me is what's crazy. I mean, and you alluded to it earlier, Chris, you grew up in Kentucky. I think if I remember correctly, your, your father was a serial entrepreneur, um, you, you did meals on wheels growing up. Family was all about passion, uh, serving bigger mission. And, and, and that's really kind of what led to this, right? Like it was before it was the data and the fascination of this and that it was, it was an element of service that kind of drew you to this and saying, Hey, and I, I, I love how you say this in one of your talks, you talk about what's the biggest room in the world, the room for improvement. But then you think about, you extrapolate this into ecosystems. I mean, oceans rule everything. Is, oh, yeah. But is that kind of, and I, I know that's grossly oversimplified, but is that kind of the path that got you on here, this solving problems, the service-based thing, the bigger picture? Is that what was the impetus here in a lot of ways? Well, yeah, there's no question it was my parents, amazing parents, right? And uh, we started a business together when we were all really young, and then that was sold when I was 29. And um, I was living out West and I've been commuting to Asia for work for a number of years. And I came home, I was 29 and it was sold and I needed to go back to work, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So, you know, being that kid who just grew up in farm ponds and creeks of Kentucky, I started spending time on the ocean off California and then just saw people were disconnected from the ocean. And I, and I was like, you know, what is the deal? Why are people so disconnected? Why do I feel so connected? Thought back to my childhood and thought of Cousteau. I mean, you know, the sad, the sad thing is, is most people under the age of 40 or 45 don't even know who Cousteau was. Yeah. Generally speaking, you know, and I'm 52. And I mean, and he was like a centerpiece of pouring the ocean into the world. And, um, and it is tricky. I mean, like I, I went back, I remember when our mutual friend Carl referenced him, of course, I've heard the name a million times and what have you, but it got me fascinated into the bigger picture of what he did as well. Cause you hear about these things in kind of mainstream culture or how we kind of present their image. But when you really learn about, you know, the underpinning, like 
what what their start was, what they struggled with, how they approach these problems. That's when you really get to a true feel for the person and the the actual work, as opposed to the outcome and the accolades, right? Right. Oh yeah. Well, no, he was. You know, he invented the aqua long and scuba diving. Very clever too. Then he was just a master storyteller, pouring the world's oceans into people's lives, and for the first time, like the undersea world, because of the development of scuba that he was developing. And uh, guy's really smart too, clever business guy, right? Like, I mean, if you've developed the aqua, aqua lung and scuba equipment and you have an engineering company, and then you're this amazing story tender to storyteller inspiring people to go look at the undersea world, they have to buy your scuba gear. Yep. <laughs> He was way ahead of his time on many levels. Oh, 100%. And just for our listeners that might not be familiar, can you give a, a brief description of the aqua lung and kind of the context of that? Well, the aqua lung is what became scuba diving equipment, yeah. you know, and, uh, and, and it was developed by Cousteau in the military and a lot over there. And he then developed some of the first underwater cameras. And, um, he, and then he developed a series, The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau, which was a worldwide phenomenon, master storyteller. Uh, beautiful cinematography and you know he led 22 expeditions around the world you know so when I was you know looking at what was I going to do with my life I was kind of like why are people so disconnected how are we going to save the ocean if people aren't even plugged into the ocean and I was young enough and dumb enough I was 29 at the time that I was like you know what I set a noble goal I'm going to pour the world's oceans into people's lives at scale unseen since Cousteau and how many expeditions have you done now 39 39 yeah. Incredible. And like how, uh, and again, forgive my ignorance, but when you plan these things out, obviously there's seasonal considerations. There's the, there's the migration patterns of whatever animal you might be researching at the time. There's so many different things, obviously the people like your crew, can you walk me through? And again, I, I, I want to be conscious of, you're probably like, oh man, but walk me through what goes into just the detail and the planning and the consideration of getting these expeditions together. Yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, very cool. Not many people ever ask me that question. Um, we really? do three. <laughs> we I, I might be the first time. We we do three twenty five day expeditions a year, and so what we're doing is the hardest tag when you move into a region. Anytime you move into a region, is the first tag because you don't really know have any data on where the sharks are, right? Uh, but you know they've been seeing them. So we started in two thousand and twelve, going up to Massachusetts because people were seeing some sharks off Cape Cod. Yeah. And then we got a couple tags out in 2012. And then the, those sharks, we watched them for, we tagged five females in those two years. And then we watched them for a few years. We went around the world. We went to, uh, you know, Brazil and Chile and Ecuador and Australia and came back and watched those five sharks for three years. Now we have all this data on where they've been. We're seeing their full migratory loop. Now we can drill down into that and see like, okay, where are they in these tracks where they're kind of just on their own and they're on the move spread out or where might they be gathered together where you have a little bit more predictable access, right? That is the Holy grail for science, what they call predictable access. If you're going to go out on a $750,000 boat ride and you're taking a bunch of scientists you want to try to get yourself the most predictable access possible so that all the money is not just for naught. Right. No yeah, they don't care about that in tourism. I can tell you that. When we went in the shark cage, you're like, ah, oh, you might not see them, but here's some sandwiches. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, when you, they look at the track, and so what we're seeing with these white sharks is they have this late summer and fall aggregations up north in like the northeastern United States and also Atlantic Canada, which we discovered a couple years ago is much more prolific and full of white sharks than we thought. Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, that whole area. Mm. Um, and so in the, in the late summer and fall, they move up there from the southeastern United States and they're feeding and they're feeding on seals. So they tend to kind of gather tighter together in front of seal colonies up there. So you have more predictable access versus in the wintertime when they slide down off the southeastern United States, they're spread out between you know, the Gulf of Mexico and Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, onshore, offshore, moving around from event to event, pretty tough to get on them there. Um, so we look for that predictable access, which, so we do one expedition off the Southeastern United States a year, and then one off of the Northeast US and one off Atlantic Canada each year until we're finished with this 
Atlantic white shark puzzle. We're solving the life history puzzle of Jaws. Yeah, right. Hey, that's a, I can, I, yeah. I appreciate how you consolidate these things. You can tell, you can always tell somebody that's been a part of a bigger mission where they've they're they're craftsmen uh, that's had to sell their story to you know a, a broader audience, and I mean sell in an ethical way because they know how to wrap it in succinct messaging, right? Like you, it's your value proposition, and it's it's tremendously hard, but you've done it a number of ways now, even just on this call. And I appreciate it because our, our, my business is all about communication. Hey, we want, we want our grandkids to eat a fish sandwich, right? Like, uh, we we're, we're the story of jaws, all these things. And I, I wanted to ask you about that. I don't mean to interrupt. So please finish that if, if, if I, I am, but when you want to make a difference, there's this inevitable tension between the people that are out there doing the thing, right? The people funding it, the people that have the science. And we see it even in, in the sports performance realm. Uh, you know, medical personnel doesn't always like strength coaches. Strength coaches don't always like sports scientists, sports scientists, and the head coach, there's always agendas. And it's, it's funny because people have this sense of localism, Chris, in sports performance where they're like, oh, this doesn't happen in any other field. I go, actually, it happens in every damn field. I'd have to imagine that this form of storytelling, this form of communication has had to be pretty helpful in terms of you overcoming the egos, agendas, and biases of all these other interconnected pieces. Am I, am I correct? Or is that, is it not like that in your realm? Well, I think it has been for surviving and bringing the world into the ocean science space, particularly here. Um, and because, you know, there's been a lot of obstacles along the way. And like you said, there's all... You know, within our own team, I overcome all these obstacles and agendas by just making sure we get everybody on a common vision, right? If we got to get on a common vision with somewhat of a selfless disposition, right? You know, ocean first, great grandchildren first. So when I get people from two different communities bickering, which really doesn't happen inside OSEARCH anymore, but then, you know, what happens outside of OSEARCH and the reason why things like OSEARCH haven't existed in the past is because, you know, the scientist thinks the fisherman is dumb. The fisherman thinks the scientist is arrogant. Meanwhile, the scientists have no boats, no money, and can't catch what they study. You know, the fisherman can catch them all day long, but you can't change the future of the ocean on a fisherman's story. You need right. this peer review published paper. So we don't have our practical and our academic colliding at a high level to make sure that we have the data required to be proud of the ocean we deliver our kids. So I'm like, guys, really, like fish sandwiches. Yeah. Would you like your grandkid to eat a fish sandwich? Everybody in the room raises their hand. All right, then knock all the silly bullshit off, man. Or, or there's that one guy that just wants to play okey dickhead that says, no, I don't eat fish anyway. And it's like, okay. You yeah, know, all right, okay, you can exit the room now. Or you can just be quiet and look, you're always welcome to come back. If you figure it out a little later, if we're moving too fast for you, you know, when you do see it, come on back and we will give you a big kiss on the cheek and you're always welcome, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that has been the biggest thing. And that has been so normal at OSEARCH now. You know, we started in 2007. It was, uh, you know, we started because the scientists asked us for help. <laughs> and then when we started to succeed, the scientists, some of them tried to stop us because we were learning too fast. And, it, you know, they didn't want us to move into a region until like after they retired to demonstrate that the last 30 years they'd spent $30 million and hadn't made much progress Yeah, well, and I, and operating it, in an individual silo. Yeah. And I'd have to imagine, I mean, when you operate as fast as you guys did, you show them that they might be pointed at the wrong direction with some of that research too. And that's not who's right, who's wrong. That's just, that's the nature of experimentation, right? And or, well, or they just didn't want to collaborate with a multidiscipline team around more capacity. They'd rather restrict the capacity and the advancement own and hoard the space, monetize it for themselves until they retire and then anybody can come in but for the next 20 or 30 years only i can work here and even though i'm inefficient not really getting much done and the future abundance of the ocean counts on it doesn't matter you know i'm on my own individual right here and uh, you can't bring that big collaborative team in here with all that capacity and expertise and solve what i haven't been able to do in 50 years and seven until after i'm gone and they call, they use words like professional etiquette. That, that's what I was going to say is, doesn't it get scary sometimes when you see people like that? And again, they exist in every field to a degree. What, what scares me is sometimes people will use 
an altruistic or a virtuistic kind of, oh, well, it, what I'm doing is in the name of science or, well, we're not, we're not trying to uh, be famous or popular. We do the behind. They, they almost try to promote what they're doing as a greater good when in reality it's a manipulation of control sometimes. You can get, it's that dark side of that, of that stuff, right? We all get, hopefully everybody gets into something they do because they actually want to make an impact. Of course, there's always outliers. But what always scares me when somebody closes off or they create barriers or as you alluded to silos and then they put this fancy sticker on it of like, hey, but it's for a good reason. Trust me, it's for a greater good. It's like, yeah, the greater good of what? Your ego or like what's yeah. going on here? Well, and I got to to a lot of these people, uh, it's, it, it's the, the system shaped the people. So when I started to see it, what was going on in the ocean space was we have to disrupt the whole approach to ocean research. Because these individual silos, that's why we have a data deficit and time problem. It's why we can't manage. Everyone's working on their own. They can't develop any capacity. We're not bringing big collaborative multidiscipline teams at a high level together. Yeah. And, and the people get shaped by the system, right? And then the whole concept of publish or perish, yeah. right? He or she who publishes first gets the next grant. So why would I collaborate and help someone else publish? I got to do it all on my own. Well, as we know, you know, a solid team will outperform an individual a thousand fold anytime. Right. Yeah. And so um, it, a lot of it is the system, but it's it was, the journey was interesting when the scientists ask us for help, then we proved we could do it. Then we exploded the efficiency and rate of learning. And then they started trying to undermine like, wait, well, well, you can't do that because uh, that's uh, you're, you, you've only been around 10 years. You've published 60 peer reviewed papers and you get another 40 coming and, uh, it's kind of like too efficient, bro. So what do you do? What did you do then? I mean, how, like, I, I always find the counter of these man, arguments. Join, me, join the team or we're just going to do our thing. Keep, keep going. Yeah. Our great grandkids got no time for that bullshit. Yeah. And, and the reason I bring that up is because we have a, a wide variety of listeners that reach out with those kinds of questions of they meet stubborn or stagnant people or power brokers in their own domain. Right. And, the, and we talk about all these ways that you can influence attitudes, change behaviors, beliefs, what have you. But sometimes you just got to push ahead. Right. Sometimes you got it like you did. You just got to realize, hey, we have a we have a sound mission, a clear mission. We have a good team. We're doing things ethically. We're going to keep going here. And everyone's uh, invited. If you don't want to come, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you had mentioned uh, getting back to some of the logistics of the expedition, and I'm sure this varies. Uh, so I'm not looking necessarily for a static answer, but how many people will generally, if, if you're going on an expedition in about a month, how many people would be on that boat with you? So we've already planned our expeditions for next year. Okay. Right. You know, so we zero in on the areas like I was talking about based on the data. And then we start looking at things like the moon phase, because we want to be out there during the right moon phase. Makes sense. Because, you know, sometimes they're more accessible than others. To pay. The moon affects everything. Um, and then when we head out on uh, expedition, there's a 20 to 22 people on the ship. Okay. That's so funny. I, you know, when you describe the moon phase, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, that's, if you were to say, well, let's have a conversation, Brett. Guess the 10 things that we would need to consider, right? I'm mm -hmm. going to consider the size of the ship, the amount of people, their domain, the equipment you may need to bring. Of course, seasonal influences and what the ocean's doing. Duh, moon face, you know, and, uh, but the, the unseen details would get you there. Is there something else like that that you think most people wouldn't even think matter? And of course it's a huge linchpin. Yeah. It's all about, it's about moon phase. It's about water temperature and about bottom structure of the area. Mm. And, and talk to me about bottom structure. What have you found in terms of the areas where you've seen the most kind of prolific sightings or what have you and looking at, I'm looking at the app right now. I know nobody can see this, but it's just incredible seeing the East coast of the United States. It's incredible. Um, so, so talk to me about some of the bottom there, if you wouldn't mind. Covered up in white sharks right now. It's yeah, unbelievable. Migrating south from Canada down toward the Southeastern United States and Florida, the bottom structure. So look, you got to learn how to think like a white shark, right? And so the captain that I've been, been working with me for over 20 years, this guy named Captain Brett McBride. So if you ever want to meet the real life Aquaman, it is Captain Brett McBride. Captain McBride. Uh, he is, uh, you know, he grew up at eight years old. He was working long range tuna boats out of San Diego down into Mexico. And he sees the water differently than anyone I've ever been on the water with. And um, so he sees the ocean when he sees the ocean, it's entirely different than when a normal person looks at the ocean, right? He's looking at the altitude of the ocean. He's watching the waves curl over. He's seeing every different species of life. He's seeing color breaks, current breaks, all kinds of things. Right. And, um, over the years, you know, I think he's really distilled it down. With these white sharks, when we capture them, they're coming in to hunt for seals. 
So if you get yourself in a spot that's poor hunting conditions for a white shark, you're not going to capture a white shark. You want it. So these things are, you know, they're stealthy. They come in, they're ambush predators. So he's finding seal locations. Then he's looking at the bottom where there's trenches and where there's a trench where a, sea, a white shark can come in super stealthy on the bottom, like right, totally invisible, counter shaded, coming in on the bottom. Maybe there's like a 15 to 30 foot ledge, you know, and there's seals up on top of that rock, right? And so he's down there, he's invisible. They come out, he silhouettes them, boom, hits them, right? That's how they hunt, ambush predator. So if you're not gonna catch, white sharks aren't gonna come in on the hunt on like the gradual sandy beach, right? Just cause there's seals there, cause they're not gonna succeed. Right. So we've been able to, as we look around and we find different seal haul outs and areas where there's seals, we look at the bottom, we understand the hunting conditions for the white sharks. And then we try to put ourselves in the middle of that. Yeah, that, that, that paints a clearer picture. And it's, again, I'd encourage anybody listening to go to O-Search, the website. It's linked in the bio, linked everywhere. Uh, but yeah, you look at the, I, of course, there's places you expect it. I've been to Australia a number of times and we have a large Australian following. Uh, you expect it around the Great Barrier Reef and just Australia in general, whether you're Perth, Sydney, off the coast or what have you. But yeah, the East Coast is just, it's, it's interesting. I see there's one chilling out by Ireland as well. Um, given, given these travels, you know, you, you go to some tremendously, uh, remote places. I remember in one, and I think it was a video with you and Brett McBride, you were talking about an expedition, uh, near, uh, the Galapagos, right. And whether it's there or it's some other place, you know, you're going to have to deal with some solitude. And I know you growing up in Kentucky and, and if I remember you describing it correctly, there's some farms and countryside, you're, you're not, you're that's sparse population as is, but solitude impacts people in a lot of different ways. How do you tend to deal with that, even though there's people on the boat, right? Like when you're just detached from so much, is that home for you? Does it get a little weird after a while? How do you well, deal with that? That's where I find peace. I mean, every, I look forward to 25 days, three times a year where people like, if they can't get in touch with me, it's totally okay. Yeah, I'd He's like on to do that. Tradition. Yeah. You know, it is the best. It's like life used to be. Yeah. It's amazing where you can, you know, just talk to people or spend time alone or read not be inundated by everything, uh, you know, get really focused on connecting to the earth. So when you're on the ship and you're out there, right, really what you're trying to do is you're trying to like deeply, deeply plug into the ocean and all of the weather at a very deep level so that you can make decisions to be safe, so that you can listen to her. She will tell you where you need to be if you know how to listen. Mm -hmm. And she will put you on the sharks. She will say, nope, time for you to sit and stay. Whether coming, she will say, today's the day right here. And then she puts you right on the spot, right? So the more connected you are, and that's what I think Brett has a very deep gift. Uh, the more connected you are, um, you know, the more you have no problems. You're out of the bad weather before it comes, right? So if you're really good at it, it's a dance and you're totally plugged in. You can make it so you never really have any crappy weather and you're always on the spot when the weather's good. But it takes, I say that after 39 expeditions, I, these are not the kind of things I would have said after expedition 10, right? I was yeah, younger, yeah. I was dumber. I, I feel a little bit more like the old bull now, less like the young bull. Um, and if you old bull it out there, you can have an amazing trip with amazing success and not get too beat up. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I think one thing that also drew me to you is I, I remember reading an interview and somebody had asked you, you know, obviously about everything you're doing with O Search. And you had mentioned that you're not a shark guy, that you never really had a huge fascination with them. Like you said, you're an ocean guy, you like data. I could relate to that because even though I trained athletes for a large number of years and still do, for me it was never about like, oh, it's the exercise in the gym. No, it was about the psychology of using training as a tool to teach people what they're capable of, right? And then it became the communication and the nuances of, oh, if I present something to somebody in this way, even if it's the same tool, same limitation, same person, I can get more effort and engage them, engagement out of them, right? There's a psychology to it. And that's always been the bigger quote unquote ecosystem that I've enjoyed. Uh, given that, given the, the continuous fascination, obviously, and passion for the ocean and data, how do you bridge the gap when, and, and I know I'm sure you have people on your team, but I'd love you to educate me on this. When it comes to communicating data in a meaningful way, 
How long did it take you and your team to really do that so you could present it to the world in a way that not just made sense to them, but mattered and hit that emotional trigger? And if that question's not clear, let me know. Oh, it took a it took a long time. You know, I think one of the other things that was difficult is just the visual of the work itself. Yeah. Everyone is like, oh, my God, look at the giant white chart. <laughs> Hey guys, just a reminder, you're hearing Chris and I discuss a lot of topics that have to do with blending science with the human component of what we do. Whether you're trying to make your research make sense to other people, whether you're trying to navigate egos, biases, agendas, anything like that, all of those things come down to communication. You know, Chris talks about how critical the ocean is to the larger ecosystem uh, of the world and the world in general. Well, that's how we feel about communication to leadership. So if you are somebody that struggles with these things or you're fascinated by social dynamics and you want to be a better communicator, whether it's building your brand or getting your message across to uh, somebody stubborn that you serve to just being a better husband, wife, significant other, what have you. We do that work and we want to support you at Art of Coaching. So please check us out, artofcoaching.com. You can also go to artofcoaching.com forward slash communication. Our work is for everyone. We have worked with people running mayoral campaigns. We have worked with doctors who are trying to navigate the telehealth space. We have worked with members of the military, scientists. We work with anybody who has to communicate, deal with, lead, or work with people in any capacity. Check us out and make sure you continue to share and support Chris's work as well. All right, back to the episode. Everyone is like, oh my God, look at the giant white chart. <laughs> they they become know, obsessed be talking, with You could be talking to them about 10 million other things and they're not hearing a word you said. Yeah. Because it's so visually overwhelming. It's the first time people have been able to see that and all these uh, various other things. And so, you know, I spend a lot more time now talking about why we do what we do rather than what we do. Yeah. And in those early years, all we talked about was what we do, you know, because it was kind of overwhelming and new for everybody. Maybe hadn't, you know, had the original why when we started, but that was from like within us. But I don't think that we ever like stop said, Hey everybody, you guys understand why, we, why we're doing this fish sandwiches. Man. Yeah. Your, your family, my family, fish sandwiches. Yeah. You know, yeah. But in the beginning, you know, especially because we were we had 30 hours on the National Geographic channel and 10 hours on the History channel. And those guys just went like, ah, giant shark. Can you get a couple guys in a fight? Oh, something's broken. If you don't fix it, oh, might you lose it all? I'm like, no, man, my chief engineer is going to go get our backup. We're going to be up and running. We're not out in the middle of the ocean off of Africa unprepared. Right. You know, so, so – they wanted to drive more of that shark, shark, shark. And that's why you see it. That's why in 2012, we left TV. We don't do any more TV. It's ridiculous. But yeah. Oh, like everything you see on TV is like gimmicky, not, not really going to lead us to where we need to get to, to make sure there's fish sandwiches for our kids. It's just kind of like light shark porn. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a few good nuggets in there, but generally speaking, it's, it, it's off brand for us to even be in that environment. Yeah. It was, it, it, it was a vehicle, right? And again, it's it's funny seeing the parallels between things. In, in coaching, that was always the same thing. You'd have people come watch training, yet they'd get video of, you know, doing battle ropes or something else that wasn't even the core of the science-driven training we were doing. And you, you get to a point where I, I remember one time they caught footage of me doing something at the very end uh, with an athlete. And they're like, oh, we're going to show that. And I'm like, you guys showed that like that was the main thing. And it typecasted our my profession at the time. I remember the first time going to speak for a corporate audience. They said, oh, your background's a strength coach, right? Aren't you a guy that yells at people and makes them do burpees? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. that would be like somebody looking at you and being like, so man, tell me all about the biggest shark you've ever caught. And like shark, 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 shark. You'd be like, uh, you're missing the point here. Um, no, no, no. Uh, and so- with that, given the fact that you did do TV for a while, right? And uh, I have to imagine, even though it was, uh, it's- well, It was the way to fund things. Uh, that's man. what you I was going to say. We, we don't talk about the enterprise model, right? We're giving away $2 million for the ship time every year to these scientists because they got no money, mm. you know? And so we so this sold- pays for over, the boats. Yeah, over about four years, we sold- $20, $20 million worth of TV. I used 10 million to fund the ship and give it to the scientists and use the other 10 million. I have a little production company to make the shows. And, um, and so it, it was allowing us to build a global brand. Yep. Right. 
Um, it was allowing us to move around the world and continue to prove the method, which is just, we haven't even talked about the method, right? It's the first time in history anybody's ever lifted a 4,000 pound white shark. Oh, we're going to get there. Trust me. I'm going to ask you about that. Yeah. And so, um, you, you know, it was part of the evolution, but then, you know, look, the original goal to pull the world's oceans into people's lives at a scale unseen since Cousteau, 40 million viewers a, a week you know, at eight o'clock on Tuesday night is not going to get you there. Um, it does allow you to build a goal. It was great. It was right in the phase and evolution of things. But then in 2012, it was so obvious that all radical scale was mobile first in the now. And after seeing things like Google and Instagram and Twitter, where they give the product away, right, give everything away, create radical scale, monetize the scale, not the product. Yeah. I was like, we got to try to Googleize the approach to ocean research. We're going to give everything away. That's when we created the tracker, free ocean tracker. We're going to give all the content away. We're going to give, include everyone. It's going to take us all if we're going to pull this off anyway. Mm. Uh, and when we began to open source it in 2012, that's when our scale and our impressions moved from like, tens of millions, you know, 40, 50, 60 million impressions uh, a year into the billions, right? A billion two, a billion six uh, of impressions a year. And that was because content is king. We live in the era of content is king. Yep. No, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sound strategy, obviously like people and people worry so much about open source. I remember, you know, there's so many secretive industries, especially those that are science driven. And it's like, Hey, come on guys. You know, every chef has the uh, recipe for lobster mac and cheese. Um, you know, how you do that is very different. Just like, you know, I had to go to a, a pre-op appointment this morning and you look at surgeons and of course, you know, th they understand techniques, but what sets somebody aside is not only their technical expertise, but the bedside manner. There's always some other example of like, how much can we put out there? So people have a real understanding of what we do and how we do it, you know, but there's, oh, oh well, if we put it out there, our trade secrets are going to be there or somebody else can mimic us. And okay. That's the old way, bro. That's the old way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how early on before we get to the method, because I do want to, it would be hypocritical for me to be in a profession where we move weight and I don't talk to you about how you lift a shark out of the water, like you mentioned, but before you had this platform, I mean, uh, you had sponsorships, you, you still have sponsorships. You had part, you had, how do you even approach those things? I mean, I, to the, to the average Joe, right. They have the idea of like, oh, well, you just keep emailing and you reach out and connections and what have you. What was your approach or was this something that was even comfortable for you? I mean, I guess you were the son of an entrepreneur, but a lot of people in data-driven fields, they don't feel comfortable trying to create partnership sponsors, even if they know, right? That approach, that interpersonal approach is hard. Yeah, well, I you mean, I think the enterprise building is just my particular strength. I mean, that's what I bring to the table on the team, you know, within the team. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of people bringing a lot of things to the table. That's kind of my thing to bring to the table. So, you know, we were doing television before and I had went out and sold all those sponsorships and started a, a, a little production company making offshore, you know, fishing shows on ESPN outdoors in the early 2000s, so-called offshore adventures. And, and then just kind of evolved that into ocean exploration because in offshore adventures is when we were helping the scientists who study things like billfish and tuna. They started complaining about sharks, pivoted because they said no big sharks, no fish sandwiches, and we don't know. Like that was like a holy shit moment. I'm like, what? Okay, I guess I better do that. Uh, you know, and that's when O Search began. Uh, and then so we rolled with the television and through 12, but then they started, it was the era of reality TV. So they wanted to kind of, it was kind of taking us off brand. Uh, you know, because we are about data driven centrists that are chasing an impact, you know, not like the biggest that, that was that era where the biggest derelict on TV won. you know, every show was <laughs> like crazier and crazier. Yeah. And, and then the open sourcing and we were an early adopter in 12, even though that doesn't seem super early. But when we decided to open source the tracking, oh, my God, the concept of the ownership and data, people went crazy. You can't do that. Then you can't publish. I'm like, wait a minute. And we figured it out. Right. And then the big collaborative teams. No, oh, we got to work in our silos. No, look, we're going to catch one. You're all going to learn. I'm not going to catch 24 of these because you got 24 projects. That's just not ocean first. That's not sure. We're going to catch one and we're going to get the same data set off one because you guys are going to collaborate rather than putting 23 other sharks through it for you one at a time. Yeah. That's yeah. how you, how inefficient is that? 
Yeah, right, hundred percent. And we started sharing all that, and then the sharks cooperated. You know, when we open sourced it, we didn't know what was going to happen. We just thought it was the right thing to do. And then you got sharks like Mary Lee just swimming down the beaches, and then every single press outlet wants to tell the story of Mary Lee because they now know Mary Lee's off the beach. Yeah, and then they need an image, right? So I send them an image with brands integrated into it. We've been able to leverage the earned media space as our content distributor with brand integrated content. Yeah, I mean, you got to. That's And that's what's always driven me nuts. I remember, Chris, one time, you know, I had this academic going long and loud because he didn't like the word, you know, in my first book, I, I, it's called The Art and Science of Building Buy-In, right? And he goes, well, buy-in, buy-in's a bad term. You know, we're not, we're, we're educators. We're, we're, we don't teach buy-in. We're not selling it, what have you. I'm like, uh, this is what you're hung up on. Right, you're hung up on a term that's a colloquialism that everybody in the world understands to some degree. And that's to your point, that's why And by the way, bro, everybody's selling. A hundred percent. A hundred. But you know, it goes back to that high horse. And that's why, like, you know, when I was researching O Search and, and seeing that you guys knew, you know, education now, you know, for other STEM, I mean, it's they're learning STEM skills, you know, and this is this is important. And you're seeing this continue to branch off in really unique ways. We work with a variety of STEM professionals on how to communicate their research. Cause again, words, they don't always come naturally to everybody. They certainly do you, you know, you're a skilled communicator, but that's the problem. When you do meaningful work, you also have to find the words that evoke the meaning of that in a way that makes sense to the other people. Regular language. Yeah. Regular you don't language. To impress anybody with your fancy words. Not the at all. Education thing, you know, the science in the now, the exploration in the now, everything was mobile first in the now. And then I went to this school in Jacksonville. I, I speak to a lot of students. And I went to this, I think it was third grade or fourth grade. This woman had a life-size shark on the wall with all the measurements. She had maps and the students were mapping the sharks as they moved in the tracker. She's like, I can't get my kids interested in like geography and math. So I just took your tracker and they're learning geography and math and they don't even know it. It's fantastic. And I said to her, I said, oh my God, can I scale this? And she said, sure. And then we went and developed a full K through 12 STEM-based educational curriculum. It's integrated into the real-time tracking on the tracker. So now you got science in the now, exploration in the now, education in the now. Everybody's in the now now, right? That's just where we are. Yeah. And um, and then it's just really exploded. It's used all over the world in the English metric system in 250 languages in uh, I think 49 states now. It's unbelievable. All right. Well, we let, let's get into the methods, right? So there's so many places we could start here from the tagging. I first I think let's go with the obvious one because let's just imagine there's some folks listening that you know, just the idea of tagging an animal seems ambiguous, right? They see it on TV. They wonder, does it cause pain, whatever. And it, I think if I remember correctly, and I'm not playing pseudoscience here, again, I was fascinated with sharks when I was younger. I, I, do, where you tag them, does it have nerve supply or how, how does this- Yeah, they don't feel anything there. It's less than a, an earring. Okay. So with the tagging and the lifting or the extraction, whatever the term and nomenclature is, I don't want to disrespect your craft. Can you walk us through some of the finer aspects of these methods? Yeah, I think that's important because people get so connected to the tracking because of the tracker. Sure. But that's one of 24 research projects. <laughs> right. We're studying the full biology and ecology of the white chart. So when we're in an area and Brett's got us where he likes to be and we're set up, um, you know, we have the main ship, which is, uh, the O search. It's a 126 foot retired Bering Sea crabber, and it has this very unique lift on it that goes over the starboard side, the right hand side of the ship, and goes about eight feet underwater. And we used to lift that to pick up a 50 foot sport fisher and stick it on the deck for like long range mothership operation fishing in remote parts of the world. But we got rid of the game boat. And we built a corral around it. Now we, so we have the ship, we have the little 30 foot contender center console. It's the boat we capture the sharks with and another 28 foot tender. That's kind of like the workhorse of the operation, moving people and supplies around. Um, the guys will set up in an area, the ship will be right there next to them. Right. And they will um, be in an area when a shark picks up a bait. I think this is the thing most people don't understand. You know, we don't really catch sharks anymore. I would say we, quickly train them, um, you know, cause we'll catch a thousand pound shark in six minutes. We'll catch a 4,000 pound shark in 35 minutes. These animals aren't tired, right? They've chosen to give up a 4,000 pound white shark could fight you for two, three days. I mean, just the amount of muscle and energy and force and all these things. Yeah. They're not, they're not, they're did not, they, like, uh. did they be stimulated to use it? 
or should they be like duped into just saying, you know what? It's easier for me just to give up. I'm not going to fight. Give ground to gain ground. Yeah. So it's, it's a condition that sharks have called learned helplessness where they know if they can't get away, they'll just go, they'll give up and just kind of cooperate. And a lot of species, it's just like when you put a baby in a swaddle that's colicky and it, and it wiggles and it can't move and eventually it gives up and just goes quiet. That's learned helplessness. Hey, I know I know adults like this. I, I've had employees. <laughs> I think there's some people that have had employees that have this. So we're with you on this. <laughs> yeah. So those guys, a shark will come in, we'll pick up a bait. And a bait is, there's no rod and reel for this, right? It's These animals are all too big. It's all hand lines and boat driving huh. and buoys. And so a shark will pick up a bait and believe it or not, when they pick up the suit, first of all, they're super finicky. It's hard as hell to get them to eat. Uh, they'll swim around you for days and not eat. Right. They, so people think when they think there's a shark, if they come in and there's a bait in the water, they just like stupidly eat it or voraciously consume it. These things are the most picky, wrong time of day, wrong tide, wrong no. They Why sometimes is that? We'll, see a shark, we'll see a shark around us for three days sometimes before it chooses to pick up a bait. Is that just because I mean they're they're inherently like you said they're they're kind of antisocial or they're distrust or they're inherently trying to nervous nervous you know, yeah. genetically nervous think about a lion think about a wolf sure think about surviving in the wild if it doesn't look right this doesn't look right I'm out of here yeah you, you know super genetically wary top of the food chain always looking over its shoulder its whole life right yeah and um. And so when a lot of times when they do pick one up, they just kind of pick it up and walk away. It's not like they come in and, and tear it up and book, you know, they just kind of swim by and like, just keep moving. So sometimes we'll see them do that. And then Brett and the guys on the contender, they will see like, Oh, look, that bait's walking away. We've got one picked up the bait. And the contender's will, another boat. The contender's a little 30 foot There's... center console. That's our game boat, right. That goes out and does all the catching okay. and brings it back to the ship. And uh, they'll go up and there'll be, you know, some, the line will come up and there'll be a handful of buoys on the surface. And we'll give you videos of this and all you want, you know, or people can watch it at the Osirch yeah. YouTube channel. Uh, they'll go to the final buoy. They'll pick that buoy up and try to do it in a way that the shark doesn't even know they have it in their hands. <laughs> right. And they'll come up on that shark, putting no pressure on the shark. It's just swimming away. It's like, oh, something's caught on me. I don't know what that is. Yeah. And then, um, and then if it's swimming away from the boat, they'll just like gently tug on one side of it and get the shark to kind of go into a slow turn until it's swimming back to the ship and then take pressure off. And literally they will walk the shark all the way back to the ship on like a loose leash. Such a feel to it. You know, it used to be you go in and you grab it, you got to fight. And I think that's what everyone thinks it is. Oh my God, that must be crazy. It's like, no, dude, we're going to outsmart this thing. We're not yeah. going to fight. Why would we fight the 4,000 pound white? You'll shark? lose. That's yeah. Smart. Yeah. Well, and, and what's fascinating about that, it's such an interesting anecdote to life. It's like when, when we try to change behavior or influence, the indirect method is usually the best. You, you very rarely win by force. You know, you just, and, and if you do, you get compliance, you don't get commitment. You know, you're not getting anything that at the end. And I would have to imagine if you wrestled it, I'm sorry. You don't get buy-in. Right. There you go. Yeah. Hey, bad term. But like, and plus I'd have to imagine, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know anything I'm talking about here, but if you, if you did wrestle this thing and it was forced, I mean, would, would that skew and ruin essentially some of the data you're getting? I mean, yeah, so right. What we're trying to do is what we're learning is time on the hook or that time is what is the indicator of what creates stress. Mm. We're, we're not seeing stress created on the animal once they're in the lift. It's all about how they get to the lift. So we'll literally have some sharks where we have zero fight time, like a little thousand pound, 1200 pound white shark. We'll coax it back to the boat. It won't even know it's there. We'll slip a buoy in front of its face and it's in the lift and it doesn't even know what happened. And then we'll go to the scientists like, because what Brett's trying to get the scientist is what like the zero stress level blood value of a white shark is. Yeah. Well, and the sperm production, wouldn't it impact sperm production too? I, I think I, you know, again, seeing some of the videos, which that is so, it's so crazy to see that, you know, to, to be able to see the extraction of that. But I mean, we know in humans, right? If there's stress and what have you, that affects that. So it would have to impact all of those things. Well, yeah, it would. But I mean, our, our interaction is so short. It's not like they're under stress for like not days, chronic. Weeks, whatever, right? Like yeah. chronic, this is something that hopefully they don't even know it happened. Yeah. You know? And then when we get them into the lift, so the lift is off the starboard side of the ship, it'll pick the animal up out of the water. 
Uh, that lift can pick up 75,000 pounds. So if, you know, one, two, three, four, 5,000 pound white shark is it, not a thing for it, right? It's from a capacity standpoint. The animal, the animal is centered in there. And then immediately when it comes up, it has a hose that goes in its mouth. So it continues to breathe okay. and a towel that goes over its eyes. Sometimes they'll move a little bit once and then they just lay there. Again, learned helplessness. They know like, well, that didn't work. I better just chill out and see how this goes. Immediately we get a blood draw from it. And then that sample goes into the lab and they're checking the stress levels of the shark while we do the 21 to 23 other research projects on that animal. Ultrasound is occurring if it's a female. She's always in with her right side up because her ovaries are on the right. So we can get a good look at her ovaries. We have never caught a pregnant white shark. We don't believe we're on them when they should be pregnant. Mm. Um, and then also if it's a male, they're chest checking the testes, looking at all the reproductive organs. We're getting the heart rate last year and through this year, we now have a full suite of heart rates on multiple animals. No one ever had the heart rate of a, of a white. What do you think the heart resting heartbeat of a, of a, like a 3000 pound white shark is? Oh my God. Well, I, I wish I knew the base level of just a uh, three, uh, uh, 86 beats per minute between six and 10. Gosh. It's like an elephant boom. And then a pause. So we're seeing like seven, eight, nine on most of these sharks. It's yeah. like uh, their resting heart rate. So we've got that from about 10 or 12 sharks. Now it's all consistent. Um, but it's like an elephant, big heart rate, big push and a pause. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then uh, we'll go about if it's a male, we'll get a semen sample and that'll immediately go into the microscope to see if they're motile and mature. We'll get fecal samples. You know, these sharks, we just finished in Nova Scotia. And every one of these animals, when you look at the pictures, you'll see claw marks all around their faces. They're all clawed up because when they hit those seals and eat them, those seals fight back. Bro. Yeah, I'd have to imagine. Because their heads are all scratched up and tore up all around them. And then, of course, when we get the fecal samples, we're getting seal fur in the fecal samples, right? Yeah. So understanding their diet. We have bacteria coming off their teeth, tongue, and gums, so we can advise all the hospitals across the East Coast what antibiotic ah. fights the bacteria in the mouths of our white sharks if there's an interaction. And then a whole new drug discovery program for new antibiotics for humans from the bacteria coming off in, in an effort to focus in on things like staph and MRSA because our we need novel sources of antibiotics right now because what we currently have is no longer working as well as it has in the past. And we get parasites. We measure the animal. We use three different types of tags. Um, we do have an eyeball project. So there's always a scientist up there studying their eyeballs and getting images of their eyeballs. So it's... Uh, tissue samples for their diet and genetics and uh and it all happens you know in about 15 to 17 minutes and then Incredible. we lower the animal back down and everyone in the world can track her from there on out every animal we touch now is the most comprehensive individually studied white shark in history what? 24 researchers getting data off every shark instead of one at a time and, and just to go back so the audience doesn't miss it you know, you talking about the DNA samples and and uh, like studying the teeth so you can inform hospitals and, and medical providers and what that that's such a prime example of why it's totally reasonable that it would upset you when people are like, oh, show me the craziness of you wrestling the shark and unprepared. You're like, dude, I'm like, dude, this, this sandwich is an antibiotics. Right. And this <laughs> thing is not just part of an ecosystem. A shark in many ways is an ecosystem in and of itself. Oh, yeah. well, that, well, and that's why we study them. Look, as they go, the system goes. And when you really back it down, I'm a big first things first guy. If we don't, if the ocean system is not working, we're all dead. Sure. It doesn't matter what we do on land. It's two thirds of our air, 100% of our oxygen, 100% of our water, two thirds of all of our air, and about half the people every day count on protein from the ocean. And so if the ocean system fails, this is one of the things I think is so interesting when you look at all research and all these kind of nonprofits and all these various activities, when you look at like earth system management, because we don't have like an earth council, which is like the dumbest thing of all time. Like we're on the no plan plan for the planet. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so, but anyway, at least if you're going to try to affect something, if the planet's going to exist, we must save the ocean first. Yeah. A hundred percent. Because if we lose the ocean, we're all dead on land, no matter what we do. Yeah. It's inarguable. So, so that's why I, and I'm a big first things first person. You, hey, <laughs> so, you're talking so to a guy that owns a business on communication. Passion. I'm with you. I'm with yeah. you on that. And then as the sharks go, the system goes. Yeah. I, uh, 
So that's why we're here in this space. I remember one note I made when we first call, talked to each other is, you know, I, I told my wife who works around our company, I said, communication is our ocean. You know, I, I told her about everything that you do. And I go, you know, the equivalent there. And, and just even with human beings as well, like you have to be first things first because they're also the first things to go. I mean, look at schools, right? No, 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 little to no sex ed, little to no phys ed, recess taken out. Who, who learns finance half the time unless you major in that kind of thing, right? We, there, there's so many people that don't learn the first things. And then we, it, because it's almost too simple, right? That's the illusion. I remember one time asking other coaches, I said, hey, wh when do you study? When do you go learn about communication, not just your trade? I learn about that every day I live life. And the, the ongoing joke is, well, I grew up, you know, I mean, I wake up every day as a husband. It doesn't mean I'm a great husband. Like I got to work at that. And so uh, it, it's amazing to me when people will look at the ocean, look at these things and they think like, yeah, it'll kind of figure itself out. No, it doesn't. And especially now, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, I'm sitting here tracking and, and I'm probably going to butcher her name, but I'm looking at uh, Una Maki, who is a 2,076 pound female, 15 feet, five inches, you know, just totally, it's so funny. People can't even put that into scale, right? You think about seeing that. Um, but with all the hurricanes, all the things in this hurricane season being what it's been, what impact d does that have, you know, on these migration patterns that you see now compared to when you first started doing these uh, expeditions? Have you seen a lot of change or are sharks pretty resilient to that? I mean, obviously water temp. Yeah, so we have some data on that. First of all, Unamaki. Unamaki, I believe, is pregnant. And if she, she could show us in this like May, June time frame where the Atlantic white, the Atlantic Canada white shark gives birth. Oh, I picked a good one. So she's good. Not only that, Unamaki, the word comes from, we tagged that shark off Cape Breton in Nova Scotia, like outrageous place, like the wild of Nova Scotia and wild ocean. And the indigenous people there are the Mi'kmaq people. And they call the area where we caught her Unamaki, which means land of the fog. Ah. So that's the story behind Unamaki's name. It's Micmac for Land of the Fog, the region where we tagged her. And she's been um, busy. I, I look at her path right now. And again, I encourage everybody to go to the website. And I'm not just saying that to draw traffic to Chris. She's and in the Tortugas, right? Oh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, but just the lot, like the distance these things cover is unbelievable. We've seen animals swim over 20,000 miles a year. So, yeah, so you got to realize when it comes back to your question about shifting migratory, we are establishing the baseline of data. There is no data from before to compare the movements of these animals so that we can understand if any sort of shift has occurred. Mm. So what you're going to see in future years is people will be comparing the movements of the animals to the data set that we're all witnessing unfold right now as the baseline of data for the range of the North Atlantic white shark. Um, so that will come down the road, but at least now we've set, you know, a stake in the ground with the baseline of data, but we don't have the luxury of comparing, looking back to anything. Yeah. Um, so time will tell, you know, yeah, we see these animals, you know, in temperatures from 80 down to the 40, when we look at their track and where they are and what they're doing. So, you know, a half a degree or one degree, you know, that's, this doesn't not really matter too much to them. Yeah. It does change things if it changes where their food moves, right? If it affects something else that then, because everything's connected. Upstream, downstream. Yeah, yeah. all those pieces. Yeah, it's fascinating. So that could affect it, but it's not going to like shove them around because they can't tolerate it. Yeah. They might shove around something they eat that can't tolerate it, so they move around a bit differently. Yeah. But time will tell. At least now we got the baseline of data. I mean, imagine this. You're looking at those tracks. That's the first time in history we've defined just the range of the North Atlantic white shark. People didn't even know that they were living off the southeastern United States and Florida all winter long. We've all been swimming with white sharks our whole lives. You know, they think about it up in Cape Cod. They just pop up there for a few months in the late summer and fall. The rest of the time, they're basically from Cape Hatteras wrapping around Florida into the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, the range of the white shark and where it lives really stunned everyone when we had, because we went from no data to a tremendous amount of data fast. Um, and then all of a sudden sharks started showing us Canada. We chased a couple sharks up there, one named Hilton. We tagged off Hilton Head. He went to Canada. He didn't go to Cape Cod. We're like, we tagged another shark, Lydia, in Florida, right in the mouth of the St. John's River there off Jacksonville. She didn't go to Cape Cod. She went to Canada, Newfoundland, and Nova Scotia. 
So then we, we chased the science, we chased the data, right? We moved the ship, we moved the team up there, found a whole new world of white sharks in Atlantic Canada. I think it might be the center of the North Atlantic white shark puzzle, not the Northeastern United States. It's just nobody knew, you know, there's not a lot of people. These, these things are invisible. <laughs> like I said, they don't want to be seen. They're not going to see them. Yeah, de it definitely is fascinating. I'm at looking at Luis. Uh, just casual, right? Western Australia, just making that migration from there to uh, South Africa. And, and I remember the first time I ever went to Perth, I look out and you just look at the vastness and you appreciate the magnitude of the ocean. And like you said, these things will travel 20,000 miles a year. Ah, it's casual to them, you know, and, and just from a nerd standpoint, because you've answered a lot of hard questions and I want to be respectful of your time. So I just have one rumination that I think would, is just funny. And then two more questions and then we'll get you on your way. Are you game? Sure, totally. One, just from a curiosity standpoint, I know this seems so stupid, but I'm a big astronomy nerd. And as we continue to learn more and more about exoplanets and everything out there that we know is just beyond the vastness of what we understand, I always ask my wife, I'm like, if this is what's in the oceans here, can you imagine, and as somebody that appreciates the oceans, can you imagine what is in some of these planets that they're discovering now that they're like, yeah, it's basically an ocean world. You know, it's a super earth. I mean, can you, I mean, now there may be nothing, right? But can you imagine well, just- I think, I think that when you look up and you understand how many places there are up there, it would be incredibly arrogant to think we're the only one. Right, uh, you know, I'm with you. On the math, just do the math. How would you like to be the first person on that expedition? You're on an exoplanet, you have the technology, and they say, all right, man, good luck. How terrified would you be to go in that foreign ocean? I mean, you know, I, I don't know that I would be terrified, but I do know this. What I'd rather do is like, look, I think we, we're living on the best spaceship going. Let's just make it so we don't need to go find one. Yeah. Because ours is so well looked after. So people, true. Are, like, people are like, well, we're going to go to Mars. Like, I don't want to go to Mars and live in a shed. Like, well, look at our spaceship here. It's got oceans and mountains and skiing and fishing and fields. And like, we are on the ultimate spaceship right now. All we, and the problem is we've been killing the crew. Yeah, yeah. So let's bring the crew back because they keep the whole Earth system working. And let's flourish. Get it together. <laughs> but, I mean, this whole, this whole fascination with, spent, with going to Mars, I get the like exploration and reaching sure. for more. Yeah, but you want to do that after you got home base looked after. And you and we know very little not, about not the like ocean. Just still. right off home base, and like uh, we got to like I don't want like the quality of life there is going to be awful. Yeah, yeah. God, I just the quality I, of life here is amazing. <laughs> I agree. I just you know when I look up, I I walk a lot at night, and I just look up, and I've always been that kind of person. I just it's always yeah. fascinating. This one's an easy one, and we're going to poke fun at our friend Carl. Uh, if Carl was a type of ocean creature, and anybody that doesn't know Carl, you know him. He's got a great episode that he's been on here before, Carl Coward on mentorship. Uh, listen to it. But this one's for me and Chris, just to laugh at a good buddy. If he was an ocean creature of any kind, what, what would Carl be here? I think Carl would probably be an octopus. Ooh, very in touch, very intelligent, you know? Like maybe the smartest creature in the ocean. Right. Yeah. Multidimensional, very clever in different environments, can change to adapt to what it needs to to survive and thrive. But still soft. Let's let's throw an insult in there too. It's still soft and yeah, you know, soft until they don't have to be, and then very capable. Yeah, there we go. All right. And the final one, my friend. What is uh and I think you alluded to it when you talked about uh the how these things get done, but what is a question? that people don't ask you enough that they really should be. How do you pay for it? Ooh, very like, boom, just like that. I like that. I like that. Enterprise behind it. That's the most, like, yes, we've revolutionized methods and we've revolutionized team building in the ocean space, but none of that happens unless you can pay for it. Well, I appreciate that. Well, Chris, thank you so much, man, for coming on. And I want, I, again, I can't be more adamant about how, how much people need to support your work and everything you're doing. I selfishly would love sometime to come on an expedition. I'm sure that's not even a, a thing, but I, I told- oh, come on out, man. Look, O-Search is not anyone's, it's everyone's. You know, and now the academic home of O-Search is now at Jacksonville University. The city of Jacksonville is building us a permanent facility for O-Search there. We're setting it up to give it away to the future. So it's really by the people, for the people. That's why inclusion is our core value. And so, yeah, man, if you can come on out, come on out. Come out. I recommend you come to uh, Nova Scotia in September. 
Yeah, it would be amazing. Where and, and is that the best place for people to uh, keep in touch, to support you, osearch.org, everything? Is there another place you'd like to point them yeah, to? Yeah, and then, you know, all the Osearch handles across Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and then all the content on the Osearch YouTube channel, you know, for your kids. Do that, you know, watch the videos, then go to the tracker at osearch.org, track the sharks with your kids, watch the films. It really is something that we're trying to build to give away, right? We're, you know, we're not trying to hold on it. We're trying to set it up and give it away. And then also trying to share the model so that we get more people in more fields of research, collaborating, open sourcing, and then it's just in the pursuit of data um, for toward abundance and trying to help people become more efficient at, at pursuing that because the current methods are too inefficient and they're not gonna get us there in time. Well, it's truly fascinating work and it's, it's a pleasure being on here with somebody that's such a strong communicator and passionate and purposeful about what they're doing, man. And for you to give a stranger so much of your time, I can't thank you enough for coming on today. Thanks for having me, enjoyed it a lot. Look forward to the next time. All right, guys, for the Art of Coaching Podcast, Brett Bartholomew, Chris Fisher, signing off.